In the first letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he spoke honestly to them. He spoke about his own life experiences and ultimately said, I am unworthy of being an apostle. In fact, Paul said, I am unfit to be an apostle, for I am the one that persecuted the church of God. Paul saw himself as one that had caused such pain. And yet what Paul would come to discover is though his past was so painful, it did not make him worthless before God. God was still able to use him. As we gather together this day for worship, let us be mindful that though our pasts are full of pain and hurt, we are not worthless before God. God will always find a way of using us. Let us begin our time of worship. Please join with me in our call to worship. We come together to honor the power of Christ's resurrection, an event not tied to the past, but fully present to us. The living Christ seeks to meet us here in song, word, and bread. His resurrection, but conform our lives to its transformative power. Please stand as you're able and join with us in our first hymn.
Creator God, you love us with a love that knows no limits. Through your gracious Spirit, you've shown us how to love and then invited us to live with your mind. Allow the simple gifts we have received and the life experiences we have earned to be used in our ministries of proclamation and reconciliation, always striving toward the ideal in the flesh of life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Visitors, we are glad that you are here. We trust in just a second you're going to receive a very warm welcome to our service. Also, at the end of the service, there's a kiosk outside. You might want to drop by there for a special gift. But right now, let's take an opportunity to welcome one another to worship this morning.
Good morning. I want to extend my welcome to that offered by Mark earlier in the service. It is good to be with you this day and want to, first of all, thank Linda Thomas, who's here filling in for Anne on the organ. We appreciate her presence and the sharing of her gifts. Today we continue our look at this series, Dare to Dream. Daring to dream the dream that God has for us. And today we are going to focus on some other words of the Apostle Paul. Words from Philippians, the third chapter. I'm going to be reading from the translation known as the Common English Bible. Hear now these words. The righteousness that I have comes from knowing Christ the power of his resurrection, and the participation in his suffering. It includes being conformed to his death so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I have already reached this goal or have already been perfected, but I pursue it so that I may grab a hold of it because Christ grabbed a hold of me for just this purpose. May our God richly bless these words of Scripture. I invite you now to join your voices on Be Thou My Vision. join me in prayer. We come together that we might know you, O living Christ. We worship together to honor you, but also to grow in our understanding of you. Meet us in this time. Teach us your ways. Form us as your disciples. Amen. In a lot of churches, I believe that you will find, both individually and collectively, people struggling with their sense of self-worth, people struggling to feel as if they are a person of value. And what often happens is that people believe, or at least begin to believe, that low self-esteem is the same as humility. But it's not. In fact, to choose to be humble takes great personal strength. It takes a starting place of strong self-esteem. There are lots of churches and Christian folks who I believe are a lot like Emmett. Emmett is a character in the Lego movie. It came out about 18 months ago or so. Emmett is considered by many in the story as the special. The special was to be one who would bring great gifts to save the world from Lord Business, the evil one. Yet Emmett is not terribly convinced that he has the tools. 
In fact, he does not believe as others do, especially as he stands before all the other great Lego figures throughout history, all the other master builders. And to see what comes next, I invite you to watch this video clip. Not that one, the other, there you go. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have been there. When you begin to wonder what it is that you bring to the table, and all that comes to mind is the negative stuff in your life, whether it is failures or hurts caused by someone else. Maybe it's the hurts that you have caused in someone else's life. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a fractured relationship. You fill in the blank in your life. And as we talked about last week, these are the things that can begin to lead into excuses. Excuses that keep us from both hearing and participating in God's dream for our lives. Yet this is where Scripture, and I would suggest life, gives us some great examples of people who demonstrated something completely different, people that felt consumed by negativity, defined by a defeat, limited by an experience of suffering, or knocked down by an event beyond their control. Yet, yet it appeared as if God called them, that God used them in spite of their past. And all you have to do is look through Scripture, and you can check the folks off the list. There are so many who have pain in their past, people who have experienced negativity, those who are feeling hopeless and crushed, and yet it appears as if God calls them in spite of their past. The Apostle Paul would be one such person. The great voice in early Christianity, yet in his own words, he says, as I shared at the beginning of this service, I am the least among the apostles. In fact, I am unfit to be called an apostle because of my persecution of the church of God. Paul points out his past, his earlier attempts to crush the the Jesus movement that was beginning to grow. Yet God calls Paul. God uses Paul in spite of his past. In spite of it? I don't know if that's entirely true. I think God did not call Paul in spite of his past, but the call, in fact, came in and through his past experiences. His ministry was formed out.
out of his life experiences, including the bad stuff. Paul was this great preacher because of who he was. Transformed on the road to Damascus, that's where he got his call. And yes, it might have cleansed him of the guilt that he felt because of his past, but it did not erase his memory. He could still clearly remember his past, those experiences, And I would suggest all of those life experiences, including his persecution of the early church, was what made him a passionate preacher and also made his message that much more relevant, something that others could relate to. Paul writes, It's not that I have already reached this goal, but I do pursue it so that I might grab a hold of it because Christ grabbed a hold of me for just this purpose. Paul is working toward this goal, this dream, this God purpose, if you will, trying to grab hold of it. But he recognizes that his ability to try to grab a hold of it is only because Christ has already grabbed a hold of him. Yet what Christ grabs a hold of is not just the Paul after his transformation. It's not just after his Damascus Road experience. God grabs a hold of all of who Paul is. The full experience, the good, the bad, the tragic, the joyful, the painful, the funny, the comforting, the dreadful. God grabs a hold of all of it and then uses it as a part of Paul's witness. Borrowing the words of my, one of my mentors, the Reverend David Merrick, David would say, I have a lot of regrets. I have a number of moments in my life that are a bit embarrassing. I've had opportunities that came my way that I failed to take a hold of. I have caused hurt and others have hurt me. And David was saying this while he was personally battling cancer. And yet David said, This is who I am. Far from perfect, none of it, uh, or some of it not pleasant. But then David went on to say, I generally believe I'm a good person. I like myself with a mix of all kinds of stuff. Because, David said, I'm in relationship with Christ, and Christ has claimed all of who I am and redeemed it all. I think that's what Paul meant when he spoke about knowing Christ and his resurrection, about participating in Christ's suffering, and about being conformed to his death. Knowing participating, conforming. Paul is describing here a union with the living Christ, a relationship with the Christ that does not erase our memories. Our sin, injustice done against us, painful life experiences, we can still name them. They're still there. As Christians, We discover, though, that Christ can claim them. As we grow further and further into union with Him, those events no longer claim us, but they die with Christ and rise into something new. You may know the name Miles O'Brien. He was a reporter for CNN and now for PBS. He was overseas doing uh, reporting on an event where 
an accident occurred and a bag, very heavy bag, fell on his left arm and he's left-handed. It was painful and he was concerned about it, a big bruise, but at first he figured it would heal. But as problems grew while he was overseas, he went to the hospital and they gave language to describe what was happening to his arms and like so many of us do, he went to the internet and, and what he read there was not good and they were going to have to perform surgery and when he woke up from surgery, he was so thankful because he could still feel his left arm only to discover that they were phantom pains. They had had to amputate his arm above the elbow. When he was released from the hospital, again, still overseas, he went back to his hotel and finished the project that he had started. He was in denial, but that denial led into depression. He told no one initially. He made no call home to tell them what had happened. And finally, when he returned to the States, people began to discover what had happened. And so many people came alongside him. So many others showed up. But what he said was, what made it so difficult is that I did not have a template for a one-armed journalist. But as time passed, and again, people came around him he said, if I had to trade it, that is, if I had to trade for my arm, having it back, or the knowledge and the love that I have come to experience, I would take the knowledge and the love. His experience, the loss of his arm, has allowed him to see the world differently. Now, my theology says that God was not the source of his pain, but God was the one who was able to use that event for something pretty miraculous. And if God can use the horrific execution of Jesus for something good, don't you believe that he can take whatever horrific or sad or tragic or shameful or painful experience in our lives and see it die and rise into something new. Mike Slaughter, the author of our Dare to Dream study, talks about in our book this very idea that it's not just the good stuff in life that God uses. But God can take the brokenness and the pain, and through our union with Christ, it dies and it rises into something, something that God can use. In the book, Mike references Nick Voyage. And Nick is this amazing person. And instead of trying to tell you his story, I'm going to have you watch a video that comes from actually the Oprah show, and she was in conversation with the pastor, Rick Warren. Everybody has complaints on the tip of your tongue. I want you just to shut your mouth and watch this tape. Because Pastor Rick had one request for tonight's show, to include a man who he says is one of the best examples of winning the hand of the devil. Just don't shut your mouth. Just don't shut your mouth. Just close it right now. Take a Thank you. 
I don't believe that God was the cause of Nick being born without arms or legs, but I am pretty certain that God is the one who has been able to claim that life experience and helped Nick to become this inspirational and powerful symbol of hope to countless people around the globe. Don't ever believe that you are useless. Don't ever allow some past experience, no matter how painful it is, to claim you. Instead, as you grow in union with Christ, allow Christ to claim it and all of you. Because when we do that, we allow all of who we are to die and to rise with Him. And in that moment, I believe God can take, yes, the good that is a part of us, but even the brokenness and the painfulness that is a part of our lives, and to use it. As you are daring to dream right now, to dream God's dream for your life, don't just look to those good things. Recognize that your ministry, your purpose, your God dream might just be something that comes out of your pain, out of a moment of darkness or suffering. I've seen it, and not just outside of this community of faith, I have seen it among this community of faith. I have seen individuals who might have initially been in darkness and, and not knowing exactly what the future is going to hold. And yet, as they grew in their relationship with God, God was able through Christ to claim that experience and to use it for something powerful, something transformative. In the same way that God was able to take the event of the cross, a horrific event in history, and use it for something that has changed the course of history. You join me in prayer. Redeem, claim us anew this day, O Creator God. For you continue to create among us. You to continue to create within us. Creating and recreating those things that you now claim as good and beautiful, even though in the moment they were painful and ugly and the source of suffering. Come among us this day, O Spirit of grace, finding union with us so that together we might begin to live more passionately and faithfully. Take all of who we are, grab a hold of us, and not just the good stuff, but every life experience so that even the negative that has attempted to claim us is in fact claimed by you, redeemed and used for good works. This morning, Lord, I wish to lift before you our sisters and brothers here at the church, included, including Suzanne and Sally, Gail, Deb, Julia, Burley, Helen, and Ken. I also lift before you Paige and Brian and their new daughter, Zoe. And as we look beyond this church, we also pray for those in Baltimore and Nepal and wherever violence or fear or intimidation is used against religious or ethnic minorities. Bring your peace, O oh God, of love, and allow people to see one another as you see them, as good and beautiful and full of promise and possibility. And yet we only claim that, Lord, because you have claimed us that like Paul, you have grabbed us and made us your own. Continue to work with us, for each of us remains a work in progress. And yet we know that you are faithful and patient. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray a simple prayer, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The church is in the redemption business. And like the hair club for men, we're not just the spokespersons, we're also the clients. We are people that know that redemption, that know about a God that has claimed us and loved us and through that experience has redeemed us. And it is through that experience, like the Apostle Paul, we are better able to be the spokespersons of redemption. And yet, if I were a guessing man, I would guess that this past week has not been perfect for you. There have been ups and downs. There has been moments of crisis. There have been times in which people have let you down. There have been times when you might have hurt somebody. And if we're not careful, those experiences can define us, can claim us. But that's where growing in relationship, coming together in union with Christ, that these experiences can be claimed and redeemed for something good and beautiful. And yet we need to be reminded about who we are and whose we are. And that's why each Sunday we come together, we worship together, we sing, we pray, we hear the spoken word, and we gather around this table. For it is here that we, he we hear the invitation to come. Not just a few, not just those that are perfect, but all of us. For Christ's invitation is shared in love and acceptance. Let us now prepare for a time at the table.
This communion table is a power, powerful symbol of God's acceptance and God's calling to a larger, greater purpose and mission. Jesus knew that acceptance and Jesus knew that calling. So on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Like manner, he took the cup and having blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, drink, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. As we come today, we too have an acceptance by God and we too have a calling. Let go of your past, grab hold of your future, a future in which there is more to do than what you've been doing and more to be and to become than whom you have been. Let us pray. Blessed Holy God, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the life of Christ. We are all special in your sight. Grab us and use us for the love of Christ. Amen.
Dear God, we ask that you would bless these tithes and offerings that we have brought to you as a small return on the many blessings you have given us. We ask that they may be used to further your kingdom in the way that it should go and to help Cypress Creek Christian Church dare to dream to be the church that you want us to be. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The week ahead will be full of maybe amazing experiences, but also maybe some painful experiences. There will be ups and downs, and yet believe that God is capable of claiming it all. And not just claiming it, but using it for ministry. As I referenced in the sermon, you don't know how often I have seen a member of this church take an experience out of their own life. And after time, after growing in union with Christ a little deeper, a time of healing, that that life experience has become one of the most powerful sources of ministry because they've been able to relate to others. They've been able to speak a word of grace out of their life experience. Be aware that that may just be the way God plans to use you. Every Sunday here at Cypress Creek Christian Church, we extend an invitation. It is an invitation on behalf of the living Christ. It is an invitation into this covenant community, but an invitation into a lifelong connection, a growing union with Him. If you wish to respond to that invitation, you can do one of a couple things. You can come forward as we are singing our hymn of discipleship, or you can meet with one of our elders or pastoral staff immediately after the service. I invite you now to join your voices in our hymn of discipleship.
before you leave this place, before you re-enter your regular lives, let me share a few things, both in the life of our community, opportunities of service, things to pray about. Um, there's a lot, but just a few. First of all, this afternoon is our area assembly, the almost 60 churches in our tradition that are in the Houston area are going to be gathering together for, for uh, um, a time of business, but also time of worship. Um, I, we have a number of people that already signed up, but if it's something you didn't do but suddenly have an interest, let me know at the close of the service and we can make that happen. Uh, next Sunday is Mother's Day. That mainly is just a reminder for me to try to remember that, uh, but uh, just make note of that. Uh, the children will be singing in worship next Sunday as well. Uh, this is just kind of a notice. Uh, our bylaws require it, but we're going to be having a congregational meeting a little over a month from now on June the 7th. Uh, it is to discuss uh, some bylaw changes, uh, but part of our uh, the business of the church is that needs to be announced about a month out. So here that is the official announcement of that meeting, though you will hear a lot more in the weeks to come. And finally, I know most of you either received a letter this week or maybe an email or a phone call announcing that uh, Clara Lewis, this past Wednesday night, uh, the minister of traditional worship here at Cypress Creek for 30 years, has announced her retirement. Uh, that will be at the end of this month. Uh, and I know for a lot of people, and I told the choir this, minds are already racing for what comes next. But as I said, let's not jump there quite yet. Let us take a month to honor and celebrate Clara, her 30 years of ministry in this place. Um, I am a firm believer that Cypress Creek is the church that it is because of Clara. Not only her gifts, her passion, but her willingness to humble herself and to make sure ministries programs happen. So uh, she's not here today, and this she was so concerned about, but her grandson was being confirmed in another church, and she said, I, I'm just really torn. Should I be here or should I be there? I said, that's family stuff. You go be with family. Um, and we will see you back here next Sunday. And I, I appreciate Jimmy filling in uh, for Clara uh, this morning. But continue to keep Clara in your prayers as she moves through this transition. When you see her next, uh, next Sunday, you know, extend that thank you for her many years of service here. On May 31st, immediately after this service, we will be having a reception for her. I now invite you to take the hand of somebody close reach across an aisle or stretch across somewhere. God, you are gracious, and you are the one that continues to bring us together as a community of faith, and there is something very powerful in the bonds of faith, that we find the strength, we find the, the conviction that though our past may be painful and though there are things that seem to define us, that you are capable of claiming us and redeeming whatever it is in our past. Continue to work with us, for we truly are a work in progress. And yet let us believe that even our most painful moments might just be a part of the ministry, that dream that you have for us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 